Hello, good afternoon, Dr. Lakshmi. Hi Vijay, welcome. Hey MP, how are you? All good, all good, how are you? All well. Fridays are uh, like literally like back to back, you're running, running one after other like a train. I know, I know, totally. How are you? All good, all good Vijay. Everything. Awesome. So where, where are you based uh, MP now? In Delhi. Oh, cool. So Vijay, we've got Professor Sivaraju from TES. You must be knowing Professor Sivaraju. Hi, hi, Professor. Yeah, I've heard. And Dr. Kishore, Dr. Kishore Kumar from Banyan. Dr. Lakshmi Jagannathan from Dabi. Lakshmi, yeah. Lakshmi, I met her two years back. At yeah, Art. yeah. I know you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two, three years, I think. Not even two yeah, years. I shouldn't years. say two years. Must be three to four years. Yeah. Hi, Gunjan. Welcome. Hi. Hi, MTS. Hi, all. Hello. So, Ganjan, you know Professor Sivraju, of course you know Vijay. Uh, Hi. Uh, Dr. Lakshmi from Davi Foundation and Dr. Kishore Kumar from Banyan. Hello all. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, yeah. Yeah. So, as I said, we'll try and keep the first your deliberation and PPT, whatever you have, to seven minutes. And then we would kind of get into the more, much much more detailed discussions once we begin. We are waiting for two, you know, a couple of more. I think the director is so NISD, Minister of Social Justice, and uh, Dr. Saurav Lal, and uh, we are. Missing one more. Dr. Giriraj is joining? Yeah, Dr. Giriraj is joining. Very good. Yeah, they have a morning uh, around 11.30 one yeah. webinar. I received a mail. Yes, yes. 
Dr. Giriraj and Dr. Saurav will be joining. Okay. okay. Just wait for a few minutes. Dr. Intaz, I have a small request. See, I'm on the way back from a meeting, so predominantly I'll keep my video muted if it is okay because of shortage of bandwidth. Sure, ma'am, that, that should be fine. But Ranjan, I have to keep it on. I can understand this being a panel, you would definitely prefer to see the people's face for whom we are speaking to, but I think oh. I'm on the way back because morning there was another interesting meeting uh, uh, organized by an industry body predominantly focused on healthcare. Okay. So I wanted to know, I mean, how to work with the ecosystem, what needs to be done. So I'm just coming uh, from that meeting. Sure, sure. No problem. No problem. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Dr. Reddy has joined us. Actually, the director had to go to the meeting. Dr. Reddy? Yes. The director had to go to an urgent meeting, last minute meeting to the ministry. So no, I am also going, sir, then... Uh, then I will tell uh, the guy. <laughs> um, I think all of us are here. I think Dr. Only Dr. Uh, Saurav is not here. Maybe he'll be joining in some time. So we'll wait for a couple of minutes and then start. Sure, sir. <clears throat> Yeah, Dr. Saurav has also joined. Hi, Dr. Lal, welcome to the webinar. Hi, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So I think all we are houseful now, as far as the panelists are concerned, and constantly the attendees are also pouring in. So uh, we can start with all of your permission. So uh, on behalf of Helpage India, uh, I welcome you uh, uh, to all the panelists, the esteemed panelists and our audience who have made their time available to come and attend this webinar. Um, Josiah Charles Stamp, the former director of the Bank of England, once famously said, uh, it is easy to dodge our responsibilities, but we cannot dodge the consequences of dodging our responsibilities. Uh, in that sense, in, with a focus on shouldering our responsibility and a positive bias for affirmative action globally across the world, the fight against poverty, discrimination, and exclusion, one way or the other, adheres to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. Or the, uh, or the SD, uh, SDGs. Now, the SDGs have a broad framework, which is popularly known as Leave No One Behind, uh, which is known, known as UN's LNOB. So UN's Leave No One Behind is the central and transformative promise of the 2030 Agenda for the Sustainable Development Goals. It represents the unique equivocal commitment of UN member states to eradicate poverty in all its forms 
end discrimination and exclusion and reduce the inequalities and vulnerabilities that leave people behind and undermine the potential of individuals and of humanity as a whole. Uh, elderly in India is such an excluded category. Uh, category. Uh, we, are, we have a elderly population of 113 million elderly in the country, which is close to 10 to 11 percent of the population. But it is projected to grow exponentially in the next two decades and almost double. Uh, and what is also very unique about the elderly are that majority of them are female, belong to the rural area of a low socioeconomic background and work in the organized sex sector with an organized sector without any social security mechanism. So it's a multiple layer of disadvantage and uh, exclusion that the elderly are faced with. And when we look at uh, the classic public health principle, uh, which is basically saying that, you know, the iceberg of uh, health and disease, uh, majority of elderly health, welfare and quality of life is to do with preventive, promotive and maintenance of health, which falls under the domain of non-medical intervention, namely care and support of the elderly. Uh, the elderly's plight really worsened during the pandemic. Uh, Helpage India, through its successive old elderly abuse awareness day study, which it does nationally uh, and publishes the status of elderly, has shown the issues of the elderly which is basically the emerging care and support need of the elderly. The first year of the pandemic in 2020, we had a report which predominantly showed that the elderly were struggling for access to basic goods and services. 2021 last year showed us that elderly are struggling to survive from the virus for themselves and their family. The mental health issues were worsening and the digital challenge was something which was overwhelming. The current year uh, study which we did just last week the uh, reports were released. It showed that there is a lack of access to health services, health insurance and gain from employment of the elderly and neglect from the family member. Uh, the common thread that we are currently seeing is basically uh, is showing a very general gap between the need of the elderly for care and support and how we, we the stakeholders, the family and the caregivers and the society in some way have failed them in bridging the gap and meeting their need. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have an excellent panel consisting of policymakers, practitioners, and leaders from the world of startups, digital and artificial intelligence, healthcare service delivery, corporate philanthropy, academics, and mental health. Uh, we hope to discuss at length the issues and gap that the elderly are facing, especially in a COVID and post-COVID context. What are the interesting innovation that has been tried? And what broadly are the roadmap going forward addressing elderly care and support needs? Uh, we hope such deliberation will shape the discourse around elderly issues, shape behaviors, attitude and practices, and hopefully lead to policy level changes in future. Without a lot of, lot of ado, I am pleased to invite uh, and welcome uh, Dr. SCH, SCS Reddy, the Deputy Director of National Institute of Social Defense, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. Uh, and I will request her to deliver uh, his deliberation and share his experience in implementing path-breaking schemes like Elderline, of which we are a large partner, the aggressor schemes, the operationalizing NAPSRC, which is the National Action Plan for Senior Citizen, and Maintenance and Welfare of Parents in the Citizen Act. We'll also request him to throw light on what roadmap the government of India is planning to take in meeting the emerging need and uh, need of elderly in care and support in a post-COVID India. Uh, Dr. Reddy, over to you. Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And um, really, I'm, today I'm so happy sharing my views and uh, in this uh, discussion with the all these uh, stalwarts, especially Professor Shuraju, sir, and Gunjan, Dr. Vijayarangan, all that this one in uh, their field, may, they are like stalwarts in that, no doubt at all, since they have so many years, uh, more than 30, 35 years, they have experience in uh, related to these uh, senior citizens, and they made so many uh, research also. Uh, then uh, our NAST also we are organizing so many uh, awareness programs, sensitization programs, capacity building programs all over in Pan India. Uh, especially in an intergenerational bonding also we are organizing one day awareness program and intergenerational bonding in schools and colleges through the universities, colleges, and with our RRTCs and with our other collaborative agencies. 
here mainly we are focus on the what is the role of the parents a role of the grandparents and the uh, grandchildren how to fill that gap based on that theme we are uh, conducting uh, one day awareness programs and we are conducting intergenerational mela <clears throat> in that mela also the grandparents parents and the senior uh, grandchildren also together they are uh, uh, in that function they are joining and uh, they are sharing their views and uh, that is also very good successful program <clears throat> and we are uh, running a Three months certificate course on geriatric caregivers. Uh, in that uh, two months theory and practice, uh, practical, and along with the orientation visit we are giving, uh, and one month on job training we are giving. More than four fifty hours we are covering in that three months course, and that is also very successful program. And the, for that uh, required only tenth pass. Education qualification is required for only tenth pass. and so many our students now they are working in abroad also like in canada australia and arabian countries <clears throat> and uh, uh, example in uh, in our some of student they started one placement agency now he gave a placement of more than 750 caregivers especially in the covid the pandemic we received so many phone calls from abroad and from the ministry and other so many some uh, other peoples they are re they requested please send the caregivers caregivers like that then also how, somehow we managed and we sent so many caregivers especially uh, for the home setting in home settings mein. especially in that covid time so many caregivers also they are not interested uh, working in the, in the home setup then also we did counseling and we sent and uh, they did very good job <clears throat> and we are conducting the online courses also on geriatric caregivers and dementia care and management and we are other uh, like one day awareness program we are conducting so many awareness programs on diet and nutrition government policies and programs then holistic health holistic health like yoga physiotherapy related and uh, other related to senior citizens we are organizing so many one day awareness programs and sensitization programs on maintenance act and uh, <clears throat> government policies also and we are conducting the residential training programs on geriatric care and dementia care and management and geriatric counseling related also we are conducting we are conducting the national international conferences workshops also and we are conducting one year pg diploma especially in that for the in earlier what i told in the three months course we are not charging single one penny that is a full free of cost we are giving that is a very huge demand also in the same time uh, we are tie up we are running one year pg diploma course and tie up with the tis and that is also one of the successful program for that one uh, we are charging 15000 rupees for admission uh, for one year uh, and that is uh, basic degree is a quali qualification is required for the admission and along with this we are uh, conducting so many other programs also uh, then uh, now i will come to uh, our small 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 and the other uh, big schemes also we are and just now all over india we so many people also they are aware about uh, our uh, national helpline for senior citizens now in 30 states and uts uh, we are running uh, this uh, national health elder line uh this number is 14567 uh now so many people also they are aware this number and the last one year may we received more than 8.9 lakhs of phone calls we received and in that so many senior citizens they called related to this covid like immunization and the uh, related to dose and other treatment related only they called so many uh, more than 50% they called related to this covid uh, pandemic time <clears throat> and that is also very good successful program in this uh, under elder line we are giving mainly four type of services one is uh, information and guidance emotional support and field intervention also in the uh, information like 
how many if they need any people like uh, uh, if they need the information regarding uh, old age homes dementia care centers or uh, police station related or like uh, legal aid physiotherapy centers uh, or um, day care related and any other issues if they ask then we are giving that information and the guidelines guidance like a legal uh, disputes related uh, and uh, maintenance act and other uh, pension related uh, we are giving the, some guidance so many uh, this one phone calls are uh, we are receiving uh, from senior citizens related to this uh, pension related and the emotional support like so many people they are calling for life, like uh, life management related anxiety then uh, relationship management that loneliness uh, so many other uh, related like physical health related also so many people they are calling uh, and the like especially in the field intervention uh, we are giving care and uh, assistance for abused elderly people uh, and uh, like here uh, rescue the uh, senior citizens and other uh, field intervention also we are looking and uh, all our implementing agencies, they are giving very good service, especially I'm thankful to HelpAge India. They are also, uh, they are looking eight states and they are giving, they are uh, providing very good services uh, in the, uh, not only the calls and other this one, in the field level also. See, sometimes they are uh, receiving so many con phone calls from related to abuse then they are going to that uh, consent person's uh, house and they are going to the uh, police stations and they are giving a legal uh, support also uh, like that we are running elder line any any person uh, they, they can call uh, this number that's number is 14567 see along with that our with, uh, in ministry we are conducting we are helping to the ministry and some other schemes like earlier, uh, Dr. Imtiaz told, uh, like uh, sacred, sage, uh, then the portion abhyan for elderly, uh, and other uh, uh, more than six uh, schemes we have. And uh, Rashtriya Vayoshi Yojana and other, this one almost uh, so many people so now they know because uh, since uh, since uh, six years, uh, they are giving, they are providing very good services, especially like. Uh, more than uh, 14, 15 type of assistive devices they are giving, like uh, apticals, dentures, uh, nevo, uh, like uh, then uh, walking stick, wheelchairs, the type of different, different uh, assistive devices they are giving. And through the uh, action groups aimed at social uh, reconstruction, that is the aggressor. Aggressor, that is simply we can sell, uh, tell this is the uh, elderly self-help groups who they are interested to make this uh, start uh, self-help groups from our ministry. We are giving uh, financial assistance for each uh, uh, self-help groups up to 50,000 rupees. We are giving assistance and who they are interested to make this uh, self-help groups, then they can go through our website, ministry's website and they can register uh, in the website. Then we will support and the portion of the end, this is like uh, uh, we are uh, ministry is uh, providing the midday meals uh, as a nutritional supplementation uh, to the identified elderly people means who they are comes under the below poverty line for them there we are giving uh, we are providing the midday meals through the panchayat raj institutions this is also our one of the new scheme uh, starting 2200 uh, gram panchayats may they started within five years we will uh, cover all over india <coughs> And another, uh, this one is uh, Sage, uh, that is a senior care aging growth engine. Uh, that's in, uh, uh, right now. generally we are calling as a startups. Uh, this is a one-step access, uh, age-friendly products and services, who they are providing uh, products and services uh, in the large number of uh, senior citizens and their caregivers. For them, up to one crore rupees, we, uh, our ministry is uh, supporting. Uh, recently also we called, uh, uh, we floated uh, EOI, uh, 50, 64 companies were registered and uh, in that 20 are uh, shortlisted, maybe within a few days we will finalize that uh, uh, 
companies or uh, uh, agencies. And another uh, one is uh, like uh, uh, sacred, that is the senior citizens' re-employment and dignity. On October 1st last year, uh, uh, our uh, Vice President of India launched this uh, uh, portal. And here mainly care, uh, this one, uh, um, job providers and job seekers, uh, that is, is there anyone in this uh, senior citizens? Uh, who they are seeking this uh, uh, employment, uh, they can uh, enroll in that website. Uh, then accordingly, based on their uh, experience and based on their uh, field, uh, maximum we are trying to give the employment. Like that, we have so many uh, schemes also. Uh, is there. Uh, then uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for giving a... Um, Time for uh, giving this information, please. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Reddy. You've been uh, you've been a very uh, frontline and vocal champion of all that is happening in the elderly care space, and we must acknowledge from Helpage India the tremendous support that you have given for Helpline, the Elderline, and other projects that are coming up. Sir, just one question. Uh, I know you have to go, sir. You have a meeting at the ministry. So we will we will not hold you back. We'll, we have a couple of questions. One is a question that I have and one more question from the audience. So the one question that I have is uh, the National Action Plan for Senior Citizen yes, and yes. Maintenance and Welfare, Maintenance and Welfare of Parents Senior Citizen Act. These are two important policy and act in, uh, by the government for the senior citizen. So basically, so I just wanted to understand because you are at the uh, cutting edge, the forefront of driving this policy with the ministry and putting up it up for parliament for you know uh, you know kind of passing this legislation uh, <laughs> where are we with that and what are the salient things that you are going to change which is basically going to change the face of elderly care in the country so briefly if you can just highlight uh, thank you sir uh, sir in the, especially in the maintenance act uh, we called we make uh, we called uh, some uh, publics uh, and uh, from other uh, senior citizens associations forums this one we received so many uh, suggestions uh, through the uh, elder uh, senior citizens uh, uh, committee uh, then uh, especially in the definitions and uh, in each district that the old age homes making old age homes related uh, and other legal related, uh, this one, uh, we received so many good uh, uh, suggestions. Then accordingly, we put up and now that is in under the ministry's suggestion. Uh, uh, then, you know, then uh, maybe in the next, uh, this one, uh, all that amendments we kept, maybe we'll get, uh, uh, we'll receive it very shortly. Sure, sir. So one more question from the audience. Yeah, and this is a classic question that you and we encounter as far as elder line is concerned because it's become so popular. Uh, why from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m.? They're asking why not 24 by 7? So, sir, uh, up to you now. Sir, this is a very good question. First, we started like as a pilot study basis. Then uh, based on the population and uh, this one, this is the initial. But in the future, definitely, we are also planned uh, for 24 uh, into 7, uh, this one, one thing. And another thing is uh, we are also planned to increase that uh, HR, like field officers also. Now, in the, you know, uh, uh, one field officer is looking two districts. And that is also very difficult, especially in uh, Northeast and other some hilly areas, uh, this one. Uh, that is, we have some plans, sir. In the future, uh, uh, sure, uh, we are planned to this one. We will give a 24 into 7 services. And uh, then also, uh, see, after 8 o'clock night, if you call uh, 8 o'clock night, 8 to morning, eight, before 8, if they call, all that calls are recorded. And uh, all the call officers morning, uh, when they open the system, then will they take that uh, print out that call list and they are calling to that number and they are inquiring and they are giving us services. Uh, then also we are giving uh, services for who they are calling like, like, like midnight, uh, 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock also, then we are uh, a reply uh, for them, sir. Right, sir. Thank you very much. There is some specific question to 
scheme related you know daycare center at visakhapatnam and all i'll request the questioner mm-hmm. to directly get in touch with nisd and sir to take that up yeah now daycare centers so that is uh, stopped sir yeah. uh, that scheme but again we are plan to start uh, that uh, daycare centers and other patients yes, and uh, kindly my request uh, is uh, uh, due to um, some urgent meeting yes. i am giving uh, then uh, please uh, kindly write down my number uh, and my email id uh, you can call any time for related to scheme programs or uh, any related to senior citizens please call me any time sir this is my humble request and uh, sorry i am uh, apologizing for this uh, listen due to my emergency some uh, meeting i am leaving sure sir uh, yeah. but i am very today i am just a few minutes back i am so happy it because I, i can share all that views and other this especially with shivra sir and all the experts um, all the stalwarts really not experts i am telling they are all stalwarts yes sir uh, that is and another one small uh, this one also we <clears throat> Uh, recorded more than 915 uh, podcasts sir we all over india we set up and this also the like pilot basis we set up 10 podcast stations in all over india this is also for senior citizens to the senior citizens and from the senior citizens senior citizens they are coming to that podcast station center and uh, they are giving like some people they are singing and uh, some people they are sharing their experiences some people they are uh, telling some smart uh, small stories and other their uh, experiences all that this one and that one also rec- senior citizens only recording senior citizens only they are doing the editing and senior citizens only they are uh, uh, uploading i dash radio live dot com in that all that related senior citizens uh, podcasts are there sir and that is also morning and evening and other sometimes that is also uh, comes in the podcast uh, this one they are uh, providing uh, and uh, nearby you are any senior citizens without then we have uh, i will share that ten podcast stations uh, address phone number uh, this one then any senior citizens who they are interested they can go and uh, um they can uh, speak related their experiences or singing or any this one also see some of this one especially senior citizens so knowledge sharing related to some of this one that is a fabulous that is unbelievable sir that type of experiences we can see in that pod- podcast that is also one of the our very good that is a very good program now uh, all over india we are plan to start minimum 10 sorry 100 uh, set up of uh, podcast centers for senior citizens all in to the all, in all the senior citizens uh, that is setting up of podcast stations we gives uh, try that we give training also to the senior citizens they try in well trained and they are uh, giving a very good uh, productions thank you so much sir and we are really grateful sir that in your busy schedule i know you have multiple program young professional joining their orientation meeting at the ministry upcoming uh, session so tomorrow, sir, thank tomorrow, you tomorrow also we have some yes. uh, <laughs> so thank you so much sir right national day of uh, drug and illicit day that yeah of course sir. and uh, thank you so much sir for making it to this meeting and we are always grateful to you for your support and and continued guidance so thank you so much thank you sir Uh, some of this one where is is a number like that they are asking right. my number please uh, write it down uh, 988 988 four 9 one second i will repeat 988 988 4 8 9 you can call any time sir uh, please uh, i am apologizing uh, for this short time and my due to some other urgent meeting i am leaving no problem sir thank you so much thank for you, sir thank you thank you very much sir. thank you very much thank sir. you sir thank you moving on uh, i have the pleasure of introducing professor sivraju my guru from tiss 
and I'm very happy to introduce him and invite him to deliberate on the overall scenario of the elderly population with the onset of the pandemic and how this problem will pan out given the findings of LASI report and the help page report. We'd also like you to share, sir, what could be the possible pathway and the roadmap that the sector and the stakeholder can take to ensure care and support need of the elderly is met in a comprehensive manner. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Imtiaj, and also distinguished panelists today for this important session, and also the other participants who all assembled to listen to and exchange your views on this important topic. Uh, can you see my slides? Are you able to see? Yes, sir, we can see. Yes. So I just thought that, you know, very briefly, because there is a wealth of information across uh, the various surveys that have been carried out, just a glimpse of, uh, you know, how to touch upon the well-being of elderly in the transitional India. India is a very transitionally moving. So that is very important for us to understand how this uh, uh, transition is also affecting uh, the lives of the elderly. So in that context, when we see uh, important aspects that we have to understand is that uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, you know, some of the pointers I thought I will share with you. One important thing is that globally, when we say developed uh, developing countries, they, most of the developing countries are uh, aging rapidly. So India is not exceptional. We are also in that same trend. And so that what is happening is that most of the developed countries have some systems which are fairly over a period of time, they have stabilized themselves in uh, responding to eld elderly issues. Whereas uh, aging rapidly in the developing countries, how these things are very, very important that is one thing which uh, we have to keep in mind because what we call speed of aging, especially in developing countries, is occurring in a very big way. And you all know this pyramid. I need not explain separately, but it gives a very important that our caregivers, you know, number is dwindling. You know, you can't expect that the luxury of uh, seeing that our youngsters will take care of, our young family members will take care of. So this is another important issue. So you may have expectation that the caregivers are going to come down. So maybe in different way, uh, thanks to communication technology and other aspects, they will still you know, continue to assist you, but physically there's going to be a major challenge that we have to keep in mind. I thought there are three important uh, you know, database we can uh, begin with. For instance, uh, census 2011, 104 million, Important thing which pointed that we have to keep in mind is that almost uh, it is a double the growth rate compared to general population, what we call speed of aging. So aging is not a phase. It's going to be here for a longer period, which we have to experience. And that phase, the speed of aging when it is 35% you know, decadal growth rate, and furthermore, around 45% in the case of female elderly. So speed of aging is going to be the one of the important aspects. Similarly, old age dependency is also important that is increasing. So to whom they have to depend? They have to depend on their working age. Another aspect is when we are talking about their employment and employability aspect, we have to keep in mind their literacy. You know, when they are 60 plus, their education standards are attained 50 years back or 60 years back. So those days, we have to imagine how the education attainment was a challenge. And furthermore, it has highly disadvantaged those days for a female elderly. So these are the things which we have to keep in mind. Similarly, the non-workers, their percentage is very, very high. So they are there, but they're interested to work. But where are the platforms? Another important social you know, dynamics that we have to keep in mind is uh, marital status in terms of uh, you know, widowhood, especially for female elderly. is a very highly you know, and the number is increasing, and furthermore, their percentage increases as age advances. And in Indian context, very specific is our rural elderly. As Dr. Rintia has rightly pointed out, female elderly, rural elderly, these are some important segments which we have to address. So when we are talking about uh, uh, three-fourths of our elderly who are residing in uh, urban, uh, rural areas, what about their issues and how best we can? And a very important 
that uh, when we are talking about feminization of aging, very, very, you know, the question of uh, their vulnerability is an important issue. So the magnitude of the problem in Indian context is it's not only its size, because its a growth is phenomenal, and the dependency ratio is increasing day by day, the potential support ratio is dwindling, and the feminization of elderly, and then multiple vulnerability. Some of these uh, consistently, our studies have started showing regularly. Now, when I see as a faculty that when you look into the central focus of quality of life of elderly, all these dimensions are very important. Not only providing services, growing, you know, important aspect about uh, strengthening the research, training, teaching, providing of services, capacity building for the people who are associated, playing an important role of advocacy, dissemination of the uh, information base, networking, you know, like uh, help is what it has done uh, on regularly carrying out. So my submission is that the field itself is so new when we are talking about aging, gerontology in general, this uh, various dimensions we have to keep in mind. All have to go together and all have to be interchangeably working together. Then only we can claim that our quality of uh, life of uh, elderly are taken very, very carefully and we are in the, in, they are in safe hands. There are so many issues. We, we have, you know, pointers like financial security, their employment aspect, the employability aspect, housing issues, healthcare issues, social integration, dignity of life. That is where we, call, you know, bring a elderly abused. So elder abuse is one of the important aspects. The important, uh, you know, though we have done, for instance, uh, several studies we have carried out. One important aspect is the distinction that is there between male and female. The degree of their problems differs widely. Rural urban differences are there. And uh, among uh, pensioners versus uh, informal sector, uh, you know, elders are there. But what, in urban context, when we have conducted study, like what HelpAge has done, we have to understand that uh, the mental health issues are emerging in a major way. So loneliness, feeling of redundancy, loss of confidence, disappointments, and uh, fear of crime or violence, they are all perceived as major problems. And furthermore, in the case of uh, you know, female elder. So when we are talking about uh, their well-being, when we are talking about uh, their quality of life, we have to you know, understand that uh, some of these issues are very, very important. How best we can tackle those issues? How can we can say that they are in the safe hands of uh, you know, caregivers and these things? And in this context, we should keep a uh, look at ourselves of elder abuse. So elder abuse, the moment the dependency starts, and uh, you can say that uh, it is mostly in the case of females, it is increasing. And at advanced age, where is the, when they are dependent, they, when they are lose their roles, when they are functionally impaired, and then they're lonely, they are living at home. Some of these are primarily, you know, contributory factors. So the important thing is that, you know, how best this uh, as a burden when the caregivers feel that resultant in a stressful situation. So our interventions, not only on elderly, even among their, you know, caregivers. This is a very important, which we have to. So the various issues that are, you know, interlinked is cycle of abuse or intergenerational transmission of violence, the dependency, intra-individual dynamics, stress, neglect, and the negative attitudes towards elderly, they all contribute for abuse, which uh, studies have rightly pointed out. I just want to, you know, uh, most of us know that in 2017-18, data collection was done. The last, you know, longitudinal aging study first wave has brought out in terms of work status, in terms of multimorbidity, the extent of problems have been highlighted health issues like a prevalence of NCD along with uh, the communicable uh, various diseases that are uh, uh, increasing the disease burden. So those aspects along with that physical and mental impairments to the extent of 11% has been you know, highlighted and uh, use of AIDS given the diversity, especially between rural and urban, you can see that uh, AIDS are almost, uh, you know, um, 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 uh, 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 double in the case of urban areas compared to rural areas. So how best we can bridge this gap when we are talking about bridging this gap between rural and urban is one important layer, between men and women are another important layer, 
those issues are very very important for us to understand and address it health insurance as uh, you know my earlier speakers have pointed out it is a very very meager hardly 18% has been shown in uh, last study so how best we can improve the ill treatment and abuse is almost more than 50% of our elderly are ill treated this is a you know one important thing is 10 years back when we have done study hardly it was a uh, 40% was reported now imagine half of more than half of the elderly started you know reporting that indicates that the incidents of abuse started increasing and different forms also it is started showing so we know very well that who abuses it is only primary care uh, caregivers so how best we can uh, address their issues like their sons daughters sons in law and spouse these are important aspects which we have and one of the important is social integration participation of this elderly hardly there is only 5% of them in the membership like even in the local self help groups ngos corporate uh, uh, you know cooperatives or uh, mahila mandals like that so and uh, as uh, our uh, earlier speaker dr reddy pointed out if uh, acts and these things the knowledge is almost negligible so how best we can increase these are the pointers from the last study coming back to help is recent study and this study gains its importance because it is a post covid important scenarios that has been highlighted in this study and here we can see the intensity of the dependency from the you know insecurity from finance the lack of uh, employment opportunities the type of work options they are uh, uh, opting the type of care that are they are uh, providing by the families the extent of their healthcare issues the nature and forms of abuses the expectations from the family members the involvement in family decision making and uh, their readiness to learn and do voluntary work that is a very important positive indicator that 40% in the help aid study said that they want to learn new things and 31% they showed that they would like to uh, opt for voluntary work but where are the platforms how much you know th those type of platforms have to be built how to be you know provided so that there is a readiness from the elder point of view now we are almost uh, you know we say that you now everybody have uh, mo mobiles but look at the data 71% do not have smartphones because that smartphones will make them you know more connected in terms of communication like that so 34% 34% need someone to teach them so these are the gaps that are required and which is very good empirical data evidence that has shown by the you know help is study now i just conclude because i'm dr imtiaz there are several speakers i am sure they are all you know will give us a very good this thing i just want to point out it's a recent like that there is a political will which is increasing day by day but it is again across different states it has to be seen because different states response is of a different nature and the allocation of resources which is important most neglected is the elderly because still it is perceived that it is a family issue so how best uh, resources can be allocated you know for the elderly care and the elderly participation and this important policies especially to integrate social and healthcare services is furthermore and given the diversity and heterogeneity in the india uh, across different states one suitable model of care will not be a blanket way of approaching different models of care we have to work it out and in terms of uh, you know various uh, layers whether it is rural urban male and female or any other segments we have to because the nature of a, a model of care will definitely vary across different these layers good practices we have to find out i just say good practices in terms of for example you know anganwadi center providing not only children you know mid meal along with them elderly you know like in tamil nadu which has been experimented like a elderly self help groups promoted by help age these are all very very innovative programs which we have to scale it up we have to replicate uh, i mean in across the country so definitely the elderly because we have evaluated the help age uh, you know five states uh, uh, study we have found that you know there is a tremendous positive response from the elderly and you know when you connect the income generating schemes and also connect them to the bank they are the people who are very honest and uh, very uh, you know um, uh, attentive in uh, repaying the loans and these things compared to general population so that is important similarly there are so many leakages which we know 
you know so how best we can strengthen our governance issues in terms of structures process and uh, their involvement of the elderly senior citizens care homes needs standards that is another way of you know platform for abuse so this you know so how best we can create the standards there are a lot of work that has been done but we have to see that those standards have to be placed then design elder friendly legal framework so that there will not be any loopholes promote aging issues because it requires multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary perspectives it cannot be just in a simple way we cannot network among stakeholders that is very very important because field of aging itself is new you know there are no experts we are all you know sailing in same boat but what we need is that how best we all can come together and we can network among each other last but not the least promote positive aging there is a wealth of information about problems of elderly negative issues of elder but what are the good practices where that same elderly who are dependents how best they can act and their positiveness can be promoted like you know like bringing them uh, you know bringing out their strength and uh, you know uh, their skills how best we can tune them so that they can have so even a small minor you know intervention in income generation scheme which we have seen in help aid study has done wonders because they find their space in the family household with the uh, across young generation they have been fully respected and that is where the abuse can be minimized so these are some of the important so how to promote the active aging from you know successful aging and positive aging so i just uh, conclude with this i i am sure dr imtiaz will uh, have uh, so lot of uh, other issues i will come back to you so uh, at the end let's add life to the years this is my submission thank you dr imtiaz for giving me this opportunity thank you so much sir i think it's been a very enlightening session for all of us i think what you did was kind of set the tone for the webinar and the discussion to follow you started from the demographic challenges and the changes that is happening and you took us to the various issues of elderly and almost like a public health of you know that iceberg of disease you know you know those uh, difficulty in access those gaps that are there abuse coming in the socio cultural milieu the multiple layer of disadvantage all of that culminating into let's say mental health issues coming to the fore elderly becoming very neglected very isolated and frustrated as as our studies have also shown so thank you so much sir for setting the context i have couple of questions one is question from my end and another one from the audience which has come through uh, very tempted to ask sir because you are at the forefront of not only academics research but I, you you are also part of lot of this government policy making bodies you know part of lot of working committees uh, setting you know the national action plan be it the maintenance act be it the national human you know human rights commission you are part of those groups and you also shaping those you know uh, policies as we go forward so just wanted to know from you uh, what in your in your in your opinion is the current uh, direction of the policy making and is it adequate to the problem that we hand and that we have in hand because uh, you would know that we have a gray tsunami coming you know the elderly population is going to double triple in the next 20 30 years and we as a country are totally unprepared be it infrastructure be it healthcare be it care and support we are totally unprepared to actually address those issues as and when it comes in so as a as a researcher as an academician and also as a policy maker uh, you wear both the hats so i would really like to pose this question to you a are the policy that are being made you know is it adequate and b what do you think we need to do more in terms of how do we address this in a very sustainable manner Over thank you dr imtiaz it's a very big question uh, answer it's so very complex but i just very briefly tell you that uh, it's an important uh, 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 you know question that we have to address one important thing is that the policy is a just a you know on a paper unless it is given you know teeth in terms of resources uh, uh, accountability time schedules which are you know very well it is lacking so the the, the change of leadership for example the, the current leadership in the ministry forming different working groups and you know so these these are the ways political will is increasing and also the database that your study lasi study which bkpi study which we did these are all the information empirically research is moving in showing what are the gaps and what are the evaluative studies are reflecting 
so this time but still one of the important gap that is there is that female elderly rural elderly elderly of aging uh, uh, advanced elderly of 80 plus these are all major important thing where we cannot neglect there should be some sections to address in the policy so for each aspects like female elderly rural elderly what are those things which we have to and last but not least we have to emphasize you know the digitization effects and how to bridge that through technology and through communication skills those things because migration is going to be a, a developmental phenomena which everybody welcomes so more and more urbanization is going to occur more and more rural urban migration is going to occur among youth so when that question is going to be disadvantage for elderly in terms of their physical care so what is the way we have to bridge that gap so technology has to play an important role so technology not only in medical and other aspects even in terms of technology in connecting the across uh, generations what is the way they have to like skype and all these thing we have to as you are rightly pointed out 70% of the people are not having smartphones even some companies have to come forward and they have to see that the elderly will get and that will make a lot of difference in seeing their young members in contacting them you know in addressing their issues so it will have a huge this thing so this is one of the important aspect but overall i can say that uh, my experience of last three decades in the aging field is that we are moving very significantly there is a creating awareness there is a different platforms coming up and people like all of us we are coming together and finding out so there is a positiveness and this is one important aspect which we have to come together very regularly and also pr to promote positive aging especially changing the mindset of the people for from the family and from the society that the elderly are there they have their skills they have their expertise how best we can so we have to treat that as a good human resource rather than passive receivers of care so we best how best we can so these are the issues because if you see the data 60 65% of our elderly are young old they are physically able bodied they are not depending physically or uh, you know so what is that they don't have any platform as long as they work they can earn but the question is what are the alternatives where they can spend time not only spending time but also you know resourceful for the society and also in turn they will also get some financial benefit because consistently several studies have shown what is the need of the elderly financial security followed by health health security these are the two important issues if we can provide them strengthen them you know empower them financially then it will help even you know the nutrition can be taken care of even health can be taken care of and these are the important aspects i am sure we will deliberate on these things so that how policy has to be revised and further more can be added these are the important aspects we will do it thank you dr imtia thank you sir thank you so much uh, we have set the context moving on uh, i think what we have done is what professor sivaraju and uh, you know he's is basically identified what are the problem areas but i think we also need to look at some solution by which we can actually address these problems and recently we've seen in the last decade or so a lot of chronic challenges and issues faced by the common man in the country has been addressed by the many startups in and that we see um, when we look at the startup ecosystem in the country it is characterized by disruptive innovation very fast paced scale up and smart leveraging leveraging of the technology thereby making it the innovation not only scalable but also sustainable and customer centric uh, it is actually currently valued at a us dollar of 332.7 billion usd uh, it's a mammoth industry with a cagr of 17% we have we are fortunate to have among us dr lakshmi jagannathan the ceo of the darvi foundation uh, who has more than 3 decades of experience including both academic and corporate uh, dr lakshmi jagannathan may I request you to discuss the role the startup has and entrepreneurship uh, you know uh, the spirit and the ecosystem in meeting the emerging needs and care and support of elderly in post covid india as per your experience over to you ma'am thank you so much sir it's fantastic being here i think a quick background of what uh, we do see uh, basically i think initially i felt i was little odd person being here but, but i think very uh, my input is the professor who spoke very subtly brought in technology into the conversation so making my conversation much more easier so we are a uh, technology incubator we work with startups predominantly in the healthcare so uh, somebody 
he has an idea wanting to develop a solution we give them funding maybe a prototyping grant or maybe a fellowship and see how this funding can enable them to grow further or somebody who already has a solution we see how the solution can be deployed into the community to be fine tuned and then taken up bigger into the market or somebody who's already commercialized we also help them how the business could also be scaled up and the community at large could also be benefited see it is in this background that i got connected to dr imtiaz and elpage probably about 2 years back in fact uh, we are now currently doing a specific program for startups are working on assistive tech the assistive tech means using technology for assisting people who need technology to enhance better quality of living right so in that background i think we are now running a covid we pick about 15 startups and saying how we can help these startups maybe reach the deployed community so this is perfectly where technology and startups and the community interplay starts happening and uh, if you see i think uh, uh, even at derby foundation we predominantly work with about close to 160 plus startups i think there are a bunch of startups who are working on solutions for uh, elderly now where do these solutions really come in now for example starting from a diagnosis of any specific disease uh maybe in terms of say disease management and predominantly i think today just on the afternoon i was talking to somebody who runs a elderly care home so he was telling instead of disease management if startups could start working on preventive health for elderly specifically he was talking about the issue of falling see elders you know i mean most of them i think the problem in elderly starts after they have a bad fall so can technology solutions be built where elders can be prevented from falling maybe using uh, and a lot of startups are working on telemedicine as an area now in this conversation i also heard that there are a lot of women rural rural women rural elderly women who are being deprived of basic facilities amenities right here again telemedicine some of them are also in the very good vernacular language using uh, video as mechanism so can these be deployed so that people have better access to better healthcare facilities or better platforms in fact uh, recently we also had an intervention where we were talking to a group of uh, a community based in raichur in karnataka who are working on the elderly so they are uh, looking at can we build a simple a uh, digital tool no platform for enabling all the elderly to connect to each other no best to basically to share their ideas talk and at least stay connected because i think loneliness is also which very quickly catches up when people are get aged right so can small devices be built like that small uh, i would say even not even a device a platform be built for connecting and uh, some of the uh, solutions which startups have also built for example uh starting from say the elderly who have a big problem of a uh, memory loss right i mean they don't even remember whether they've taken the medication on time what are the medications so can small gadgets less expensive affordable gadgets be built so that elderly are able to keep the regimen of their medication on time from simple devices like this to really serious issues like say alzheimer's detection management today startups are all over no in terms of providing a lot of these solutions uh, i think my urge here would be say i think uh, now we are all of us are living in i mean sort of working in isolated islands for example here we have a bunch of startups who want to build solutions but searching for mechanisms to validate their idea number 1 number 2 to see for example if the startup today working on what is the solution required for a geriatric population They, most of them have no clue they are assuming couple of things and then started working so is there a way we could give them defined problem statements for which technology solutions are needed number one number two if there is somebody who has already built up maybe a proof of concept so can we get support from the geriatric community from the ngos to 
probably run a pilot, make a demo. Even a demo would give a lot of input to these startups to fine tune their the community can be benefited at large. Number two. Number three, startups already have a solution. Again, for deployment, you know, there's a huge struggle. Now, again, another interesting interplay, what is also happening is there are a lot of corporates who have good fair amount of CSR budget through which they also want to intervene and see how these solutions can be deployed in the community. Say, for example, if a corporate has a CSR agenda that improving healthcare among geriatric patients. So then collectively, it will be good for all of us to see how technology solutions built in by our own Indian startups can be deployed in the community to improve the better quality of living for the elderly. So I think uh, I would definitely thank uh, Dr. Indias and Helpage India for bringing this holistic perspective and bringing all of us together to see how we could work together to enhance the quality of living for all of us. Thank you, ma'am. I think that was. Uh, are you done, ma'am? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm done. I, I, I said I was about to say. So, uh, say. Yeah. So thank you, ma'am, for that comprehensive, uh, you know, presentation and deliberation. Uh, ma'am, just have a uh, couple of questions. Uh, yeah. Because uh, we work with the disadvantaged elderly. As I've said in the beginning, a lot of the disadvantaged elderly are from the rural area. So, what in your opinion is uh, basically uh, you no know, social entrepreneurship in the startup space, which is basically looking at those disadvantaged communities, especially elderly? You know, do you see a growth there, or is there a intent that there is support in the ecosystem to get it? Yeah, so I think uh, you know, see to be very frank, you know, though we say social entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship always has to end up with profits, has to end up, it cannot sustain on its own, right? But any entrepreneurship towards solving a specific social problem is broadly termed as social entrepreneurship. So even if there are social entrepreneurs who are building businesses for the societal good, ultimately they have to sustain themselves. I think keeping this in mind, businesses have to build, be more holistically on a self-sustaining basis. I think that is very key. And probably leveraging technology for that is a better way to scamp, ramp up and also scale up faster. I hope I've answered the question. Sure. My, 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 my last question is, I think what you said about, you know, the corporate startup partnership program, you know, that was very yeah. interesting. Next up, Gunjan would be, you know, you know, very keen to put this up to Gunjan. But ma'am, I just wanted to understand, given that in India, only 10 billion, you know, out of the entire investment in startup, only 10 billion a year is from the domestic market. 90% of the investment is overseas capital. coming in. So given this scenario and somebody who is a social entrepreneur wanting to do something in rural space, how, how, what are his chances as per you, what you see of him getting a support and actually scaling up and having somebody, uh, you know, underwrite his risk for his place to basically succeed? No, uh, Ravindas, I think the risk you know, of an entrepreneur cannot be underwritten by anybody, right? Entrepreneur has to carry on the shoulder, right? I'm talking about the financial that, risk, yeah. Yeah, so having said that, I think now there are interesting models evolving, especially on the CSR front. Now, for example, you see there are two ways, you know, one is uh, if, especially on the elderly and healthcare and geriatrics and all that. Now, if corporates are interested in, say, geriatric population, supporting geriatric population, I think organizations can, can collectively see how to support these corporates in realizing the dream of having an impact on the ground for geriatrics. For example, somebody says, I want about 25,000 screening to be done for geriatric patients. No, say, for example, uh, eye camps to be conducted. So then what we could do instead of leveraging or again going back to multinational comp uh, companies or using their solution, there are a lot of startup frugal solutions which are being developed, which can be deployed to conduct these camps. Again, the same objective is also achieved. Maybe that is one way of looking at it. Other thing is, if there is a corporate who has a business which is allied to what we're talking about, right? Maybe we could see how we could build solutions. For example, if somebody is say, building a solution for a geriatric patient, right? For a geriatric population, I would say. Then we could see how we could align his interest and help identify innovations 
which could be deployed in the community all of us collectively i think the mantra today is about collective or where uh, aligned project and then implemented there to a large extent no this also helps in directing the entrepreneur especially on the finances right thank you ma'am thank you very much i think yeah. your your session has been one enlightening one for us all of us because we we deal with elderly issues day and day, day out but we really wanted to understand how the startups could become a you know a you know, point of lever for us to be able to make those yeah. you know uh, changes and leverage uh, that we are looking for uh, i think yeah. the age is all set for gunjan so gunjan you got a very big mandate from ma'am on how do you look at startups so uh, ladies and gentlemen gunjan is the regional director of sap sc uh, and head of csr sap india he spearheads strategic csr and sustainability initiative for inclu inclusive sustainable impact for the community at sap he has been responsible for lot of the ground breaking work that sap does in the csr space be it the code unnati or the or the or the collaboration with the government with atal innovation mission or niti ayog uh, and apart from donning a lot of hats i think gunjan and i way, go way back as an alumni of tss he happens to be a friend and classmate uh, happy to see the growth that gunjan has uh, gunjan uh, i'd really like you to enlighten us on the role of csr uh, for example indian companies have typically spent uh, around uh, over rupees 1 trillion since the csr law came in 2014 15 it's a massive space how do you see and you know in your experience how does it you know go forward in shaping and guiding philanthropy in india uh, in basically meeting the emerging needs of elderly in india we saw a lot of support during the covid so is it going to be a sustainable one or is it is it a passing fad that we saw which is one time and may not come back so over to you gunjan floor is obvious yeah thank you uh, thank you dr intiaz and uh, uh, you know uh, it's really nice uh, to see uh, eminent speakers uh, and like uh, dr lakshmi mentioned even i was feeling quite odd odd person out in this uh, group of uh, eminent experts academicians researchers and policy makers but uh, now i can see uh, holistically how this particular topic uh, should be addressed and uh, and dr lakshmi you have uh, set a lot of context for technology so uh, uh, and and also uh, you know professor sivraj you spoke uh, at length about uh, uh, various aspects and imperatives in the geriatric uh, you know topic or issues and uh, and i want to pick up certain things from there as well so uh, before we go get into that so sap is a uh, enterprise software uh, uh, you know global multinational organization and uh, essentially we are a software product companies which works on several uh, uh, you know businesses and function areas uh, but uh, here it's a, it's a very important topic and why a technology company and the csr representation right so uh, it is needless to say that uh, how technology can and should play a role of a socio economic enabler for everything that we do and if i want to relate it with uh, sap's uh, csr work uh it says it states that powering opportunity through digital inclusion now digital inclusion has uh, uh, you know uh, it, it defines what we intend to achieve and uh, basically if we if we have an inclusive approach uh, using the power of technology we can actually create opportunities for everyone and uh, this whole uh, topics of uh, geriatrics or elderly population it has multiple top uh multiple sub topics or issues etc right and uh, how they can be addressed so there are uh, you know different policy framework that was discussed upon Dif different kinds of research has been uh, undertaken to to come up with uh, approaches and plan forward uh and and i think uh, it is it is needless to mention that csr can and will have to play a very significant role because uh, uh not from a mandate perspective but now i think uh, uh, many companies like us and most companies like us are really looking this as a way to uh, you know uh, contribute to the nation building uh, exercise uh, so so when we look at uh, you know technology and uh, 
and and when we look at the uh, the very theme of this particular deliberations is how we bridge the gap um and and uh, and i'll be also candid here so we do not have very significant work in the areas of uh, elderly population but uh, uh, having known ibtiaz and you know last two years we we have had the opportunity to work with helpage india and uh, uh, i mean it is needless to say that uh, you know there is always a portion of us which want us to work on on this particular important topic of of elderly population um and and when we look at the technology so i think uh, i i would like to uh, just speak about what we have done uh, and then how, what would be our way forward so for example uh, imdia spoke about code unnati program now that is predominantly looking at uh, youth children and adolescents and imparting uh, digital uh, skills it is imparting digital literacy among this audiences however what we have realized then again uh, it also has some credit uh, to uh, helpage india is that how this technology enablement capacity building teaching training etc can happen for uh, communities for for uh, you know population which is not necessarily a youth but uh, again not necessarily an elderly population but the citizens who are who do not have jobs who are in rural areas and how they can be part of the uh, this whole digital inclusion revolution or how they can be part of the uh, technological advancements that are happening um, and professor sivraju's uh, work spoke about one kit- critical component is teaching training capacity building so what we have started doing in a small uh, way is uh, creating uh, uh, you know digital community centers with a uh, few of our stakeholders and idea is that we actually uh in a structured and instructor led ma- mode uh provide uh, some kind of a uh, very basic level of digital literacy to uh population which is not youth uh, and also some of them are uh, 50 plus so i i won't even call them elderly per se but definitely uh, we are building that kind of a foundation for for that kind of a population who will then gradually become let's say 60 plus and senior citizen then that case they would still leverage this so our digital community centers key uh, you know function is to uh, build or socialize uh, this population with uh, let's say something as simple as what is a smartphone how various apps can function now uh, government also speaks about uh, uh, through its national digital literacy mission and other agenda about technology usage right so we have uh, we are also uh, uh, teaching or rather uh, you know training this people on how they can use uh, various welfare schemes available through them uh, and build awareness through the technology so <clears throat> we are creating kiosks we are creating uh, and providing uh, actual infrastructure uh, wherein you know this population can access to uh, 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 you know technological means then uh, and and it is needless to say that you know this is where we uh, uh, we are trying to uh, also build their digital financial literacy and lot of financial stuff and uh, now that uh, you know the uh, let's say upi or or net banking and many of these things have become uh, quite prominent but of course it is not that widely penetrated everywhere so uh, it through our little means we try to build that uh, capacity and knowledge or know how amongst uh, this population and uh, and i think uh, uh, especially from a geriatrics population technology will how to play a significant role uh, uh, and it is at the intersection of let's say community uh, policy policy makers uh, uh, executioners uh, practitioners academicians and beneficiaries so uh, uh technology will be in the pole position and all these other stakeholders can can revolve around it and then subsequently technology can help the beneficiaries so this is this is one of the ways where we we are trying to do a little bit um and uh, here again let's say uh, thought leadership from uh actors like uh uh help page india can can really help because uh, you come with lot of uh, expertise know how and and uh, somewhere the marriage of technology with your expertise can help us uh, build a 
road maps or build solutions for uh, you know the, this uh, beneficiary audiences and uh, dr india you spoke about solution i think another very important area is uh, csr and uh, startup slash social entrepreneurship collaboration and uh, uh, dr lakshmi aptly highlighted so i'll not go into what startups can do uh, india you spoke about disruption and innovation so these are all widely acknowledged facts um, and definitely uh, you know their uh, government mandate also allows csr to work with uh, incubators and uh, startup ecosystem so uh, we have had of course we do not run very uh, program specific or or subject specific startup uh, acceleration program but we have uh, sector agnostic program and i think uh, somewhere we can also explore that how we can work with let's say uh, you know a partner like helpage or 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 uh, Uh, incubators or intermediaries who have experience of working on healthcare public health and uh, issues related to a geriatric population and uh, there is ample of csr money uh, which you can we can channelize for this particular domain many many companies uh, who believes in innovation many companies who are into medical devices and so forth, so and so forth or many tech companies like sap who are also willing to actually uh, see that if we can uh, further help accelerate and and uh, provide you know seed money or grant to startups via incubator or via uh, let's say you know non profits like helpage that would in a way foster the innovation um, create that uh, you know uh, risk money or risk capital uh, which would which would help innovators also to innovate and uh, most importantly we will be able to create those innovative solutions uh, we did work with or we we do work with uh, you know in incubators like uh, ciie at iim ahmedabad then in the past we worked with iit bombay's incubation center and they 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 have certain innovations in uh, in in the in the domain of healthcare so uh, Uh, you know uh, csrs like us would also be quite open to see if there are disruptive innovative ideas or or you know startups who can provide solutions to uh, let's say disadvantaged uh, elderly population for uh, elderly in rural areas and this is where such frugal innovation should play its role and that's where the csr uh, money can really help uh, uh, you know programmatically uh, absorbing any any systemic risk absorbing any risk that is associated with uh, you know startups growth and also i think uh, uh, opportunities are a plenty and uh, again i would reiterate that you know technology uh, Uh, inevitably will play a role of an enabler uh, whether it is direct intervention or intervention through social enterprises slash startup etc so i i will stop here and uh, again hand it off to dr imtiaz thank you so much gunjan i think lot of what you said is music to our ears because within helpage we run a, a fairly you know sizable program on digital literacy for the elderly our rural uh, livelihood program also has digital centers through which we try and kind of see how we can link the elderly to the digital highway because all the schemes and everything is now you know online you know digitally through the aadhaar bank account linkage and other things yes so i think we will definitely be in touch uh, my colleague i just want to add yeah. i just want to add here uh, dr imtia so i think this whole digital literacy for elderly and uh, Uh, you know programmatically as well as bringing at times you know our employees and uh, can build a kind of solution where 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 elderly skills building can can take place so definitely looking forward to that kind of collaboration definitely gunjan i will um, you know we will be in touch with you with our digital head uh, being in touch with you on how we can take this forward i think what you also said was pretty interesting in terms of how you could actually you know uh, provide those risk capitals for those innovations to happen and 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 how do we take that forward uh, typically what we have seen during the pandemic and otherwise also is that elderly have an inhibition towards digital technology in terms of its usage they're not sure they they're, they're pretty apprehensive about the risk so when i just wanted to ask you because i follow a lot of the work that you do in code unnati and other thing uh, i just wanted to understand what has been the unique initiative and innovation at your end 
in the area of the CSRs, in the, in the space, CSR space, the work that you do. And how do you think that those are some of things that we could take to, let's say, elderly care or, you know, um, you know the issues of the need for elderly care and support and basically revolutionize, so to say, the ecosystem and basically, you know, kind of look at, uh, you know, finding a solution to something which is appears to be a big thing, but let's say with levels like technology, and other enablers will be able to really ramp up the speed. So, uh, see, under Kodunati program, and um, most companies like ours uh, has one persistent challenge is of, uh, you know, uh, skilling of youth and, uh, uh, you know, that kind of a manpower. And, uh, uh, and and that has direct repercussion on employment opportunities and stuff like that. But, uh, uh, it is also important and we already realized uh, long back that you know uh, digital inclusion in in toto would only happen if we look at the full spectrum of our uh, uh, let's say uh, life cycle right and uh, um, that's where we have also pivoted some of our programs with the objective of uh, targeting to um, communities and their uh, digital literacy or digital financial literacy um, and and it requires uh, not just awareness building uh, but also infrastructure and bringing in that kind of uh, uh, let's say uh, trainers and uh, expert who can actually understand this topic and take it to the beneficiaries um, and uh, these are all uh, uh, you know uh, I would say more outcome or output based programs where our only objective is that we enable this uh, this group of citizens with uh, with the uh, technological know how so that they can actually uh, leverage this power of technology. So uh, we have started this community based interventions in uh, you know various parts of India uh, and um, uh, and not actually big cities but uh, importantly in some of these rural areas and uh, uh, i think what we are doing here is we are also working with some of the private sectors and of course we implement the program through non-profit organization partners but when we partner with private sectors it gives us scale it gives us uh, uh, we can ramp up our programs and we can uh, we can have ma much uh, wider outreach in our program otherwise we would be restricting ourselves into few cities only few big cities where uh, there is a lot of saturation. So that's the uh, outreach and scale is happening. Now, India is a vast country. So no matter how many collaborations one would have, uh, we would not be able to cover uh, the, the, the vast swathes of you know, population. So always this kind of collaborations would help. Um, and I think we also moved early in, in this whole startup ecosystem or uh, social entrepreneurship innovation space. Uh, I would also be honest that we haven't come across many such uh, startup or social enterprises who, are, who work in elderly population, but we are open to explore such, you know, uh, targeted intervention also wherein, uh, uh, you know, we can look at how the social enterprises supported and uh, how maybe some kind of uh, innovation, co-innovation can take place and they leverage technology. I mean, we, we don't insist anyone on SAP technology. It is any, any technology that can help uh, uh, not just the creator, but also more importantly to the beneficiary audiences. So we do work with technology business incubators because that's where uh, CSR mandate allows us to work uh, with social enterprises, less startups and uh, having worked with uh, uh, incubators can help uh, CSR to actually invest money into social enterprises. And again, because this is a CSR money, we don't expect any return. Whatever return gets generated will get go back to the incubator and incubator will have to use it for the program again or for the further investment into social enterprises. So basically, it, it would become a much more sustainable model uh, when CSR invests via the incubators uh, for any such uh, innovation. Gunjan, one uh, question, uh, last question would be before we come back for the next round is um, uh, you know, a lot of these elderly who have retired, let's say in the urban area, middle class, upper middle class, elderly who are in search of you know, uh, second innings, so to say, you know, some job opportunity, some engagement opportunity, not for the financial part of it, but more, much more from an engagement perspective. Engagement. Our study also showed a lot of these elderly are willing to work. You know, close to half of them said, you know, we want to do something, but there is nothing in the ecosystem which is offering us. And most of them are also willing to work from home. 
so thanks to covid i think technology has played a great role in in, in the remote working of people so where do you think sap and you know player like you and others come in where we kind of fill, you know fulfill and try to address this gap where there is a big vacuum of skilled elderly uh, mm -hmm. i'll not even say semi skilled skilled and highly skilled people with their own experience with their own uh, you know uh, uh, not also enough knowledge from their work who want to offer their services but somehow not able to do because there is an impediment in terms of technology or the ecosystem not enabling so maybe question to you yeah, and yeah. also maybe dr lakshmi on how do we also make it inclusive for them abanjan so uh, see uh, we know that you know elderly comes with uh, wisdom and life experiences and uh, you know of course they would have worked and that means they have those experiences also behind them uh, there are two two different components i would say number one uh, definitely we there is a possibility and uh, opportunity to skill them particularly in the areas of technology and these are not rocket science kind of a technology these are this can the, these are the technology which can ease uh, doing your job right so we can we we need to identify what are those tech or what are those uh, specific uh, technology which we should train others people into number two we need some kind of other collaboration like for example now help page can come in as a knowledge partner that this is you help us identify you can connect uh, them and we can provide them training but uh, simultaneously we need to also create a, a you know demand uh, machine wherein if uh, we train them they also get to be somewhere absorbed where they can work right because um, providing skill uh, or supply is already there but we if the supply needs to be met with the demand so we need to bring in uh, a kind of uh, i would say corporate or other actor or other stakeholders who can also absorb them because um, uh, you know certain uh, corporate and their nature may not permit them to work with certain uh, kind of people uh, uh, and uh, let's say tech industry right so um, we need to look at which other industry can can absorb such people and we we can fulfill their uh, digital literacy training kind of a requirement and you can play, uh, you can play a role of that bridge wherein you you help us meet at a common point so so the beneficiary would get that uh, end benefit at the end of the day sure thank you thank you gunjan i think you have been very informative in terms of you know the issues that is facing in delhi and what csr and sap Okay, and, and all of us can do together. Uh, moving on, um, Dr. Lakshmi, if you have any comment, otherwise we'll move on. Uh, you know, this brings us to uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan. Uh, Vijay is uh, basically uh, he is the CEO of uh, Factal Analytics, and he's currently driving initiatives around analytics and AI for the healthcare and life sciences. Uh, basically, uh, Vijay, you know. Uh, what we've seen in the pandemic and the in the way uh, you know elderly have been excluded i think one of the main factor has been the access to digital you know technology so a lot of the elderly didn't have smartphones where they could order their groceries order services so they were struggling they had money in the bank but they couldn't go out because of the lockdown and uh, they had uh, they had everything but because their support system servants and everyone the driver Uh, caregivers stopped coming you know they had this issue and then they actually struggled quite a bit you know trying to address this now what has that resulted in is that they are now some of them have come onto the digital platform but that's a very minuscule of elderly who have come and the great apprehension that they have is that they view digital as something which is not very friendly because typically you know the financial transaction is something that they are very apprehensive about and also the fact that some of them have been also duped online so that's something that is which is a deterrent for them so with vijay i would like you to you know bring it bring in your deliberation how the digital world can re be reintroduced to the elderly as a friend and a companion and how their needs can be addressed through let's say artificial intelligence or other intuitive technology which makes it not only under friendly but meets their need and bring them to the center of you know social interaction because digital also excludes them from that social interaction which has become predominantly online nowadays so over to you bijay no thanks so much uh, uh, dr antias and thanks for putting this panel and it's amazing to see everybody think through from that perspective right all of us are thinking 
very young uh, on a topic which uh, is to do with the old which is actually the right thing to think uh, be it about entre- uh, entrepreneurial entry into this place or a csr budget uh, dr eddie spoke a lot about initiatives uh, professor shivraj spoke about what we are not able to accomplish uh, i just want to do a little presentation of course there are more than 100 or participants in this group and trust me dr mtias uh, i've been through such panels in the past uh, you would have a 10 or a 12 people or a five people and once the panel ends you know you would they would have dropped off it's finally the panelists who are in that panel so to see the attention yeah we have, we have 300 plus on the youtube link with yeah so to see the attention of participants uh, to see the questions i was just going through those questions because they are the ones which are actually going to tell us the future right the number of questions we are asking is what is going to help us see solutions a year from now or two years from now it's incredible so i must say that you know as of the the sector itself is uh, you know the importance of senior care it's gone beyond policy public uh, you know it's gone into us as individuals so i think we are more excited about bring that value i'm going to run a very little uh, slide deck uh, just let me know if you can see this uh is this visible yeah which is it is okay so i just want to start from a very simple point that whenever we think think about digital right and technology uh, we usually uh, talk a lot about ye nahi karega wo nahi chalta ye nahi chalta and all of that and i think it's a very fair point uh, i'm asking a simple question which is how can we look at technology which can help us achieve something more and beyond Uh, as much as we as humans are going digital savvy right we are going digital we are learning digital even digital is learning to be a human so there is a very clear uh, you know today we are talking about humanizing artificial intelligence what it means is to is to bring in emotions of human uh, into digital so to that extent which is which is very rare for us to see how digital is trying to become a human and human trying to become a digital right that combination i think puts us in a very sweet spot because it brings out what we call empathy and healthcare is all about empathy right so how do we have digital deliver things beyond uh, what we are talking about and what does it do more for us with that empathy at the heart of it so i'm going to take four uh, not to kind of go deeper at it but just take four uh, four interesting areas and four interesting observations that we can actually put in i'm taking a question uh, so the fact that you know a lot of this is about we don't have right now all the answers it's all about questions that we need to frame in our mind right and that's the starting point the very first is you know we are in a different world today we are changing times and changing needs uh it's very interesting uh, i think professor uh, dr shiva uh, sir brought it up that we are we don't have enough penetration of mobile phones in elderly right which is actually true but if you go and search in amazon and i did it uh, there are about 2000 phones that will come up if you just type mobile phones you get 2000 phones uh, interestingly if you type senior friendly mobile phones you will get 205 of them i went through each of them uh, and and different phone has different capabilities uh, you know button to light to heavy duty to all of that so at least 10% of the phones uh, in a marketplace is elderly friendly now that's a good starting point for us we may not have all the money to have bought all the phones because data says only 5% of mobile phone users are above 50 years uh, which clearly tells us that there are enough mobile phones ready for elders but we don't have enough elders having those phones with them so the very first is i think we should democratize digital by leveraging the power of this handheld phone because that's the companion with us so when you said mt Uh, dr mt has about companion i think the mobile phone takes the form of a true worthy companion and if we can have access to that uh, it helps us so that starts off the moment you the question is what happens if you have a mobile phone right what changes it actually genuinely changes and a lot of what dr redigaru spoke about having a helpline access leaving a chatbot message we we heard a point on podcast uh, he spoke about podcast right so a mobile phone ensures that you have someone who you can speak to whom you can converse with and also listen in and also play a little bit of games right so it's going to bring in a lot of uh, mind share uh, and a good mind share for us so with changing times i think we need to look at it from that fresh perspective going on second perspective uh, it's 
it's not worth just getting a mobile phone we need to fix the basic things first uh i kind of this is a very simple stat and it can be even worse than what i've put in that one out of every two seniors they face limitations to travel to hospital uh they feel restrictions restrictions could be i am not able to drive because i have got told i am not able to drive because i have my children gone to office i am not able to drive this time because so there are reasons to it right so and this is where covid taught us that you don't have to go to the hospital the hospital will come to you in the form of home testing home surveillance home monitoring home rehab so it's important that we build uh going back the entrepreneurial uh, journey digital must help us build uh, the second line of continuum because this ensures the limitations of mobility uh and the need to seek healthcare gets uh you know gets well managed going in once we've got the mobile phone uh ensured that we have health coming at home the question is how are we going to pay for it uh and and that also came up in uh, professor siva's uh you know a, a lot of them uh as we see are using internet to search for jobs and elderly uh and again it it so call correlates with what we saw all through the day as a pattern Uh, about 8 million elderly would love to supplement their income uh, love, love to supplement themselves with an income if required so which is very clear that uh, we're talking about how do we create opportunities for elders where they don't have to pay for services but rather pay them for their time now one part of it is that entire reentry and reemployment the second part where i see a lot of movement uh, the next two decades uh, is on data currency uh when i say data you know human body has so much of data being collected that data is of very uh significant relevance uh we are not going to pay someone and say i am going to buy your data but we are going to leverage the power of their data to understand patterns so in some sense data as a currency is interesting and very useful a lot of elderly actually have volunteered for uh giving their time uh you know we all talk about uh you know uh something called big boss where you lock people inside a room and you pay them for sitting inside that room that's exactly what we say for the elderly that can you lock them up for their experience pay them for what they are using so different patterns that can get assessed and the last is about leveraging them for a 24/7 monitoring and 365 you know it's how simple we see a lot of elderly who take care of communities walk at night for night share, night calls security safety all of that so it's about how do we leverage them for helping us in remotely monitoring our country our world right so that becomes a very clear direction uh, ideally we would want uh, caregivers to talk to care receivers freely without much of a stress and inhibition so that and uh, their ability to get employment and money brings that in so now that all these are taken care of i am an elder i have a mobile phone i have access to uh, my healthcare at home and now i also earn my money what is most important is going beyond uh, health uh, unfortunately digital has been thought of as you know put some wearables we'll track your heart rate we'll capture your ecg now all of that yes we can by the power of digital but what we need is beyond that in fact we heard uh, dr lakshmi spoke about uh, elderly fall we need to look at elderly and digital far more closer uh, we need to look at it from a very 365 degree perspective uh, which is how do we leverage digital to solve for the young old to old old because i think professor siva brought it up that 65% of the elderly are young old so to that extent we don't really have to worry about hospitalization and organ we have to worry about keeping them well uh, and their well being is more important rather than illness management now this is where we're talking about digital playing a role uh on a lighter note you know the new metaverse there are more games for elderly than for uh, the young kids and you should try some there are 20% of uh, matrimony sites are flooded with elderly so there is very clearly a need to relook at life very differently and this is not small right so to sum it up i just want to say that uh, we need to start thinking so the role of digital uh, today uh, digital is also going to be part of uh uh included in the social determinants of health and i am happy that you know this came up as digital inclusion as a context because digital is a power today it's like a currency 
uh, and it's going to be part of a determinant of health as we go. So to that extent, digital is the one of the weapon that we can actually leverage for all the good. And how do we look at uh, moving all these four, right? Uh, and leverage these. Eventually, I think it's a state of mind. So I want to leave this thought uh, with us before I kind of hold, uh, you know, wind up this discussion. The belief that elderly are older is not uh, the norm anymore. It's actually the new young. Uh, whichever we want to take it, we can take it because the largest population as we go will be elderly. There are already some countries like, say, Japan, who've reached that situation of having highest sentinels, highest elderly populations. So it's important that we recognize that the area that we need to focus and we need to innovate is actually the area that is called as elderly. But honestly, that's the youngest of all we are problem solving. So I take a pause here and yes, Fractal is, uh, just to conclude, I am a director because I wish I want to be a CEO at some point. Uh, we are more excited about solving problems uh, and we believe that artificial intelligence uh, can help us solve uh, purely because it solves at scale. One of the examples I want to leave is uh, any day when we wake up, about 20 to 25 million cars, uh, bikes use Google Maps. Now, artificial intelligence is sitting in Google Maps. It's helping 20, 25 million reach destination knowingly or unknowingly, we must have disturbed 20 million people or 10 million people or 2 million people in the past when Google Maps didn't exist. That's the power of digital, that it can help you deliver something which a human can at 100 times the scale or a 200 times the scale. So those days, I think we used to go and ask someone and stop the car and ask, Acha batao, how to go? That is stopped now. And we are asking Google Maps. And maybe today, because of Google Maps, the number of people who are asking have gone down and actually the using has gone up. So that's the fun of digital, that it brings more and more people into the uh, leverage without even knowing. So that's the thing that we need to kind of aim for when it comes to senior care. Just taking a pause here. Uh, and thanks for giving this opportunity. And Dr. Imtiaz, I must congratulate you because it made my life easy. From policy to data to insights to CSR to entrepreneurship, I had the easiest job to finish it. Thank you so much, Vijay. I think very well presented, I think. Uh, concise presentation to the point and you did a good job of it. Uh, uh, so Vijay, I think uh, one one major question that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, maybe you've answered it in your PPT, but I just would like to kind of reiterate. I think what predominantly we see because we deal with the elderly through 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 helpline, through various projects. I think one, one major thing, as I earlier said, is the overall apprehension and not seeing the te seeing technology as a friend, you know, that's the smart smartphone, the internet, you know, the digital highway, and the other things, and that is where the main impediment comes. Added to the fact that you know all these uh, you know um, uh, rumors and everything about people getting duped online, uh, being being placed of their money, is something which actually deters them from coming. So, is there something being done currently, or can be done? which basically looks at using all this AI, intuitive technology, everything coming together in making it a very elderly friendly thing. For example, I think the government of India some time back, you know, kind of um, did this experiment with ASHA workers, you know, with the, with, the feature, with the feature phone, how do you enter data and send it to, let's say, a central repository where it gets collected, collected and analyzed. So something like that, because I think, Majority of the elderly are okay with the uh, with the use of a feature phone, so to say, but not very comfortable with smartphone. Because they, basically, that the trust issue comes in. So, Vijay, where, where do you see this going? So, uh, Dr. Kempias, this is a very universal challenge as well. And elderly are more vulnerable purely because uh, their access to seeking information or uh, support is also low. Uh, there are uh, there are different solutions that have come. And for example, I'll give an example of low code, no code, uh, where you don't need to really code big out. So which means that you, your user interface also gets into a much easier frame. A lot of innovations are happening on non-smartphones, uh, which is all about how do you uh, leverage the power of internet in a non-smartphone uh, without really worrying about internet data sets. So there are these coming in, but what happens uh, particularly with digital or technology in particular is it gets used then misused and the regulations then come into existence. So it's unfortunate, uh, but then, you know, the learning is what teaching you to build a new policy around it. So that lag window 
uh, is a window where exploitation does happen. But immediately there is a layer of support that gets built in as we go. So that learning will mature soon. Uh, this problem is, uh, is, is very much right now because we are talking about dealing with money on platforms, phone. We are exchanging uh, messages, information. So when you suddenly have all parts of your data going in that smart box, the crave of a hacker to hack that goes up. So eventually it's going to balance out, but I must say that not every policy comes in uh, ahead of time. But then yes, there are data protection laws. There are, uh, there are certain surveillance. Cybersecurity has gained 5,000% uh, over a period of time uh, in, in terms of the leverage. So they are going to fall in place. Thank you, thank you, Vijay. I think till that time when we have those those technological innovation coming and making it elderly friendly. I think for the current, I think elderly are mostly about all about look and feel and you know physical access. Um, yeah, that yeah. brings me to Dr. Saurav Lal, uh, who is the general manager and head of, and head of hospital operations at Max Healthcare. Um, Dr. Lal, uh, welcome to the discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, India has a, a you know a huge healthcare market of elderly you know uh, elderly healthcare market which is as per the CII report 2019 is 50000 crore and growing as we as we speak uh, we'd like to understand from you how does the healthcare and the hospital industry uh, view this opportunity and what are the challenges and bottleneck and critical drivers and levers which you see is presenting itself both as a challenge and an opportunity in urban and the rural segment over to you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Intias. The way, uh, so uh, initially, uh, what I would say is that a lot has been said. And uh, because this is not a medical conference, I will not go to the details of geriatric medicine. But because it's a, a Help Page India platform, I will probably mention that uh, uh, there has been a fundamental change in how hospitals have started viewing the geriatric uh, patient of today. Because today's patient... Uh, is not just uh, an old vulnerable patient, but is also a patient who has the, uh, you know, uh, the need for that fourth dimension, which is the softer aspect of healthcare. As much as the medical treatment related issues uh, are, you know, getting better over the years, technology is coming in and we are able to handle those kinds of surgical uh, procedures on older patients much, much better. But I think the real difference that hospitals have started looking at is, is the engagement side of it. So, you know, there are two, I can divide this into two parts. We can talk about the macro level and the micro level. So if I talk about the macro level, I think we have started, uh, you know, involving uh, and focusing energies on, on senior living on geriatric medicine as a specialty, as a dedicated specialty, and not just a part of the internal medicine or general medicine part of also, a lot of focus on the psychological and psychiatric needs of uh, this pop this part of the population. The concept of uh, pain being optional is something that we've really started coming up with because uh, needless to say, uh, the geriatric population has a lot of uh, basic uh, conditions and diseases like you know osteoarthritis, uh, cancers, etc., which uh, at times are painful. So we have started promoting the concept of uh, disease being there, but pain being optional. So, you know, a lot of uh, senior patients that we see who are not in a clinical situation to undergo surgical procedures or correction procedures, um, we motivate them to actually look at palliative care and pain-free living. And uh, I must tell you, uh, you know, I'm a very big promoter of that personally, uh, not just in my family and friends, but also to the thousands of patients we meet wherein we try, try to, you know, make them uh, conscious about the fact that pain is optional. So, and, and by the way, uh, even sitting in uh, the capital city uh, of Delhi and in uh, one of the very prominent hospitals of the country, there are very few patients who, you know, understand that concept today. The next um, uh, uh, topic I will briefly touch, about, uh, touch upon is that uh, geriatric care is also about personalization. It is about uh, understanding the needs of these patients and, you know, being able to give that personal touch. There have been many situations in our uh, clinical careers where, you know, that personal touch gives more healing than the actual uh, treatment, uh, you know, in, in totality. And that, that's where 
um, you know, and you know that that's basically where we've started working on. So we've spoken about CSR initiatives, but I want to mention something which may probably be an anti to what we've been discussing on the digital piece. Uh, post COVID, when there was a vaccination drive across the country, and uh, there were um, it was the buzz of the town, and I'm talking specifically of the first uh, dose of vaccination, where half the people were. Uh, of the opinion that if you get a vaccine, then you'll live, otherwise you will die. And that was the concept. I, I suddenly realized that it is, the, the, the overall modus operandi was quite a digital divide. And uh, a person who doesn't have a smartphone or does not how to operate a smartphone was practically paralyzed when it came to the process of vaccination. And as a hospital, we took up the challenge to reach out to these patients, not really patients, but these populations, the geriatric populations, who were unable to actually book an appointment for their vaccine, actually download certificates for their vaccine, which was all on an app. And we realized that more than the action of vaccination, they were thrilled by the fact that they are re being reached out by somebody who is offering to do that on their behalf. And that is where I feel that it is more important to customize the digital journey of geriatric population. So, I mean, I, I see a lot of uh, customizations on handphones where the letters are big, the numbers are, you know, big size numbers, et cetera, et cetera. I think that is a real value add to this population because at that age, if we expect them to come up to speed as they were in their younger days, or maybe, you know, change their behavior at that age, I think it is unfair. So from a psychological standpoint, I think um, the world should shift to accommodate and, you know, accept them rather than, uh, you know, being able to, uh, them being able to, um, you know, adapt to, to the fast paced world. Also, um, you know, as, as a hospital, we, we have a lot of initiatives that come in and most of them are happiness initiatives, uh, stand up comedies, internships where, you know, young doctors who come into the system are kind of, you know, exposed to the environment where there are geriatric people and make the environment more lively. Look at, um, you know, uh, cooking initiatives, look at moral support initiatives, crowdfunding platforms, a lot of patients who need surgeries and cannot afford it. So as corporate hospitals, I think it is our uh, moral and uh, societal duty to be able to have platforms where crowdfundings can be done. And that's quite a successful model in today's time. Uh, an example that comes to my head uh, on this engagement piece is that uh, about 10 years from now, uh, my father, uh, who, who's a doctor himself, and we live in the same house, used to really be disappointed when any of us would pull out our phone on the dining table. So his rule was that when you're sitting together as a family, nobody uses their phones. And just a decade next, I see my father using the phone more than me. <laughs> I've come into that zone. So what I'm actually, the point I'm trying to make is that in this age and, you know, in this day and age, an investment of an iPad or a good vis vis visible phone screen to a, a parent or an elderly person is way, way more valuable because it's like, you know, buying a fish for a person and teaching a person to fish to eat food. So I think that is the attitude that the society should start looking at. Also, I had spoken about the micro uh, aspects of uh, geriatric care. I think uh, apart from tech support, it is also about a lot of infrastructural customization, personalization of infrastructure. So these days I see a lot of initiatives and not just in the hospital, but also in apartments and homes where there are panic buttons, where there are uh, geriatric customizations of washrooms, there are handlebars. And trust me, it's so easy today. It's it's all on the internet. It's it's on websites, it's on Amazon. You know, people would come home, fix it, and, and it doesn't cost much. So I think, you know, uh, we somebody had mentioned about, somebody had mentioned about uh, falls. I agree that a fall is a huge incident or a huge accident in that age because healing gets uh, you know delayed and most of the times it doesn't heal completely. So these are things which you know uh, the society is now uh, changing to and and kind of uh, becoming more cognizant of. There are monitoring devices, new startup based um, uh, startups have come up with new monitoring devices which can actually intimate the healthcare facility directly when it comes to 
care for these patients. Uh, so, you know, by and large, uh, it is more of a culture. So uh, I, I, I would try to put it this way that um, we have grown up in a culture of donating and giving. But I think now is the time when we need to realize that we need to build that culture of sharing. It is not the younger population giving to the older population, but it is the younger and the older population sharing that space in society. And that is the only way acceptance comes. And trust me, most of the patients we see, good, bad, ugly, rich, poor, all straighters of society, they all have one common need. And that common need is acceptance in society. So even a poor patient who walks into the hospital wants to be accepted. And you can see the same expression on a, on a patient who's probably coming in into a Mercedes and a BMW. So, you know, the, the needs are very limited. It's not only money. The culture of sharing comes with, um, you know, volunteering. Uh, in the COVID time, I have seen, you know, senior executive CXO level people actually taking unpaid leave from their work. I mean, the easiest thing today to do is to donate money. That's the easiest thing to do. But what really makes um, us, uh, you know, a geriatric or elderly friendly society is when people can take out time and, and you know, come and actually carry the, carry the uh, baton to the next level. So, I mean, uh, in the interest of time, I will hand it back to you, Dr. Imtiaz. Thank you, Dr. Lal. I think very enlightening. In fact, I know I came with the selfish interest because I come from a hospital background before coming to, uh, 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 coming to help age. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, I, we, we, uh, Vishnu, can you, can you block the person, please? Exit him. Yeah, thank you. So I came with an expectation of hearing a lot of hospital EBITDA related, you know, insight. But thank you, Dr. Lal. I think been very insightful in terms of, you know, the sociocultural milieu that we are in and how does the elderly and we, you know, more, more important about the elderly, you know, the, you know how do we, kind of, you know, cater to their need rather than them fitting into our, uh, you know, expectation. But thank you so much, Dr. Saurav. I would again have a question, you know, uh, from my own, you know, selfish interest of asking you, how does this, how does the private healthcare look at the rural elderly, let's say, you know, the rural population? Is there some bit of strategy thinking in terms of looking at a subsidized model or an outreach model? Uh, how do we cater? Because at the end of the day, those are the group who are there, which are majority in number and their need at, at the end of the day, we would need to you know cater to. We would always have Absolutely. urban elderly who are affordable, who can pay, but these are the larger segment which needs to be looked into. Yeah. So I think uh, my view on that is that uh, we are about two steps away from that. The first step is to be able to actually provide access to uh, rural areas in terms of healthcare facilities and skill. Uh, the COVID pandemic has done something very significantly good for us, which is the advent of technology. And today at our hospitals, we are actually reporting X-rays, CTs and MRIs for, you know, tier three and tier four towns, which wasn't probably possible without the advent of uh, technology. So I think the first step is actually to be able to do video consults. And I'm talking of access because even today, there are a lot of villages which don't even have internet. Mm -hmm. And and hence, uh, we need to first work on, on the infrastructure to have access to a credible clinical or medical facility uh, skilled doctors who can actually diagnose the problem. And then is when we can actually look at, you know, having, so today there are a lot of patients who get uh, shifted from rural areas into our hospitals and there are schemes and, and uh, you know, CSR initiatives around it. A lot of crowdfunding is something that we promote. What is interesting to see is that crowdfundings happen to uh, get, uh, you know, contributions not only from outside, but from staff and doctors within the hospital. So a very common thing that we've seen as a trend is that the treating teams would also donate to the crowdfunding. So that's a good culture. That means that people are actually, you know, they're, they're kind of responsive and, and sensitive to the fact that the rural population needs help on the medical front. And uh, I think it also gives a lot of, uh, you know, uh, for the lack of a better word, uh, brand respect uh, the moment you move into a rural or a semi-rural area. And I think collaboration with smaller centers and smaller hospitals in these local areas is something that we should start looking at in the future. 
Thank you, Dr. Lal. Moving on, um, we have the last speaker, Dr. K. V. Kishore Kumar. I think that for selfish reason, I have kept you till the end because I, uh, you know, we passionately believe all the elderly issues, whether it be the digital divide, the access to healthcare, the neglect, abuse, everything is culminates into the mental health issues of the elderly. And we have seen that in the last two and a half years of the pandemic through our various studies. And that is where, sir, I wanted to come at the end to be basically able to, you know, kind of sum up you know, the discussion in terms of where it is leading to. Uh, so Dr. K.V. Kishore Kumar for the audience is a trained psychiatrist in Nemhans, Bangalore and worked in community psychiatry for 30 years. He's currently the director of Banyan India. Banyan is a premier organization in mental health issues. Uh, given that we have seen, sir, the elderly has faced a lot of mental health issues during the pandemic, you know, ranging from depression to frustration, waiting for the phone to ring, you know, the web, you know, second study that we did last year, you know, nearly more than half of the people who are actually elderly were waiting for the phone to ring, somebody to talk to them. They had no, uh, they had, they didn't know that uh, they, they were feeling cornered. They found the future to be bleak. So such a, in such a scenario, sir, given your experience, uh, you know, what do you think are the challenges, uh, various stakeholders' role, our preparedness, and what are the policy level changes that you then desire? Over to you, Dr. Uh, Kishore Kumar. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Imtiaz. From listening to the presentations uh, from 2.30, I am taken aback to understand that I come from a different world altogether. I, I come from a world where uh, uh, use of mobile phones, whether they are uh, uh, smartphones or otherwise, is almost alien to people who might treat. And therefore, uh, uh, I was taken aback. But there are many issues that we need to really talk about in, uh, with respect to the elderly. We have uh, close to 10% of Indian population aging and uh, by definition elderly and this population will is likely to get better because we are getting better with respect to our health care uh, and this is posing tremendous challenges at this time because of the changes in societal, familial, economic, political and other values so much so that elderly are left for themselves to defend and therefore, uh, we have come to understand that elderly are liabilities than assets to their families, which is an extremely sad situation. So in the context of uh, COVID and its consequences, how has healthcare become a challenge to be delivered? As you understand that many of these people are stuck in remote areas, they often have no uh, provision for transport, the support for them is I think there is a connectivity issue with Dr. Kishore Kumar. So we will connect with him. Um, but uh, coming back to you, Professor Sivaraju, I mean, we always hear this concept and this is a very European foreign concept of time bank, you know, where you put in some hour of working for the elderly and then later your elderly can benefit from those. How feasible do you think, you know, such a concept in India is? It's a very innovative, I think, uh, you know, uh, time bank is, uh, uh, I also, you know, uh, saw in uh, literature, one important thing is that uh, that awareness yeah. if can improve for uh, at least in the urban context, uh, especially in the organized sector where you know there is some form of uh, you know time maintenance is there. Yeah. So if we can test with those group, then I think it will be very very uh, you know. So it has to be in a phased manner. We need to take it to consideration. Are you able to? Yes, yes. Please, sir, continue. We yes. were just filling in for you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so therefore, uh, in my opinion, primary care systems like uh, our National Health Service, both in the urban and rural areas, will have to play a crucial role to reach out to these people 
in the form of ambulatory care. Gone are the days when we thought patients could come to the hospital and today we have reached a stage where ambulatory care is going to be important either through health workers or ASHA workers, providing support for the depressed, for demented individuals, those who are living alone, those with physical comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, strokes. Uh, the life of people who have disabilities due to stroke is miserable in India and uh, this is because Doctors expect them to come to the clinic and they are unable to come to the clinic because of lack of money or transport and there is nobody who is willing to bring them. So I remember uh, as a psychiatrist in Nimhans where we had to provide very many kinds of uh, solutions to people who are unable to come to the hospital. Then uh, moving on to the family, I don't think we are in a situation where families can abdicate themselves or responsibility of caring for the elderly. Families are extremely crucial. They have to play an important role and the families will have to learn to accommodate, accept elderly and integrate them into their families, bring in their experience so that the younger ones are able to learn and move on. They have so much of wisdom, knowledge, that they can bring in and uh, share in the, uh, in the family situation. So the advancement and the social development in our country is pushing the elderly to the periphery. And that is, in my opinion, a very big loss. Uh, law, uh, lack of bringing them into uh, the main fold, being very inclusive to make the elderly part of the family is going to be a very, very important factor. Many of them who have been excluded because of uh, the neglect by the family have often have had miserable lives. Some have committed suicide. Some have died of starvation. Some have died due to the chronic stress that they were living in. And the third factor is uh, how as a nation we can support the elder. Uh, as a nation, we will have to think of elderly as a very important group whose experience is important. And we will have to start from uh, the childhood, adult, adolescent uh, period and the young adulthood to say the responsibility for the elders. Uh, we are all products of somebody else's sacrifice, mothers, fathers, uh, grandfathers, and grandmothers. But we conveniently forget about them when we reach a stage when uh, we become less accountable. We may throw some money and uh, forget about it. That is not going to be useful. So the family value orientation is an important input that we will have to make in our country. Every elderly individual will have to be insured and they have to access healthcare. Um, and the healthcare system will have to provide the healthcare in a proactive manner rather than making them come and seek help. Many of the problems are very, very simple problems, yet they have difficulties in uh, reaching uh, healthcare. A problem like depression can kill many, many elderly because they have difficulty in accepting that I have become helpless, I cannot fend for myself, I will not be able to make decisions, I cannot uh, deal with the society and therefore elderly suicides are much more common. Worst is the, is the life of people who are uh, uh, going through memory problems like dementia. And we also find that increased longevity in rural areas who have worked with the soil, who have been agricultural uh, persons have more dementia now. And uh, this is going to become a terrible, terrible problem. So the proportion of people who go missing uh, in the context of old age is becoming very, very high. And uh, the, the last question is, can we as a society uh, 
develop a policy. So we have to, yes, we will have to provide proactive care for the elderly in the primary health care system and in the urban locations. We will have to have specific secondary care, tertiary care, geriatric hospitals, which can address the needs of the elderly. There has to be a, a community source where people can participate in brain games so that memory deterioration can be decreased. Uh, there has to be volunteers in the villages where they can spend time with the elderly to provide them the support that is necessary, often reassurance, medication, support for comorbid physical conditions, providing them food, increasing access to medication, are going to be very, very simple. And if that is done, a lot of uh, distress can be reduced in the elderly population. Ultimately, we all know that three things are very important for the elderly. One is money. Second one is health. Third one is social support. So every elderly will have to be provided the supports that he or she requires by developing self-help groups in the village, by developing support systems in cities and towns so that they are able to interact, share their experience. So formation of self-help groups across the domain in villages, in small cities, in, in small towns and bigger cities is going to be a very, very important one. Providing free transport for the elderly is one way of increasing their access to healthcare as well as social participation. And all of these things are likely to make their life very, very different. The, the technological intervention that you were all talking about seem to be very far from elderly at this point in time in my experience. I come across people who are the poorest in the society I come across people who cannot reach healthcare on their own, whether it is mental health problem or physical health problems. So all of these people will have to be proactively reached at and bring them into the system to provide care. So uh, if that is the kind of situation, we also require a lot of resources to provide intervention. The most important issue that uh, somebody also pointed out is frequent falls and injuries because of two important aspects. One is the visual uh, diminution of visual acuity. And the third, second one is the peripheral neuropathy that they may develop. This results in uh, imbalance and falls. And falls makes life miserable. Many people who have had hip fractures have almost spent their life uh, lying on the bed with bed sores and life becomes miserable. So we don't have a system where uh, that can be uh, reduced. Uh, I believe that Pradhana Mantri uh, insurance scheme is going to mitigate the distress, but there is always uh, very little support available. So in summary, uh, COVID, post-COVID situation has brought about a lot of changes with respect to access to health care because of various factors that we know of, proactive interventions for the elderly, providing them preventive interventions so their memory remains uh, intact or the degeneration is decreased, providing care for comorbidities in a proactive manner, which is at home at home is going to be most important. And third one is giving them the monies that may be necessary in the form of pension, increasing their social supports will bring in better quality of life for the elderly. Elderly has to be considered as people with abilities, people with knowledge, people with experience, rather than as people who are liabilities to the society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, one question that came to my mind, 
was the issue of mental yeah. health as a society, as yeah. an Indian society. And we, we don't view it as, as, as something which is, let's say, uh, you know, uh, the importance that we give to a physical element. Uh, you, talk, you talked about the life cycle approach. Uh, uh, and in, in our society, you know, mental health issues and illnesses are viewed as something which is, you know, it cannot happen to me or it cannot happen to my father or my mother, but it is very much there. And it is, you know, you know the awareness is slowly increasing, but more increase in awareness and sensitization is what is required. So in your work as, as, as a psychiatrist, and also through the work that you do at uh, the Banyan, uh, what is the, you know, would you be able to share some experience of some interventions, let's say at a community level or at a household level, which is basically yeah. geared at, you know, this behavior change coming about? Right. So the mental health of the elderly can be broadly classified into functional problems and organic problems. Organic problems are more frequently elder encountered in the elderly due to the comorbidities that is existing. Depression, anxiety, loneliness, other kinds of psychotic disorders can also be uh, commonly encountered problems. Sometimes the problems could be due to interactions of drugs and uh, a lack of food, water can also result in what is called an acute organic brain syndromes. So what is important, therefore, is adequate nutrition, adequate hydration, adequate medication in appropriate dose and providing them support is going to be very important. If we think that antidepressants can fix all problems, it may produce new problems altogether and that can result in falls and injuries and so on. So therefore, antidepressant medication in appropriate dose for the elderly, support for them to live life, provide them food at home, and uh, make their life easy by providing all the help that is there. For example, in Western countries, there is a program called as Meals on Wheels. These programs are provided to people, so food is provided to people, support is provided to elderly at their own home. But we think that all of these things are facilities only for the elite, but it is not for the poor. So we should be in a position to translate these elite interventions into even poor interventions. Uh, in, uh, interventions for the poor at the level of the community, which is the village, so that all of them can have access to something. Of course, we will not be able to do everything for the elderly, but definitely something is possible. And therefore, all of these things are proactive human interventions, which does not require money, but we have to have a strong commitment for the care of elderly, because we are all standing today because of their sacrifice. Thank you so much, sir. Um, that brings about to almost the end of the webinar. We saw we've overshot the time by quite a bit, but I think it's been a very engrossing, very engaging, and a very uh, you know qualitatively very high discussion which we had. I think the issues of care and support for the elderly is something that we will continue to come back to. But I think if all the participants and the panelists, all of us take back on what we have seen today and uh, discuss and what needs to be done and do in our own small way of what is possible and try to change the ecosystem. I think that would be a big step forward. I thank all my esteemed panelists for uh, you know, allotting their time from their busy schedule and coming here today. I'm very much grateful to the 100 plus participants that are still with us currently and are listening in. I'm very also thankful to my colleagues at HelpAge India, the senior management team, our extended team at HelpAge India across the country, and everyone for their support. And not to mention Vishnu, uh, who has always been there for us in supporting us through the IT. Thank you very much. We look forward to reconnecting back with the same topic other, but always for the cause of time. Thank you very much, and have a very good day. Thank Thank and goodbye to all of you. Thank you. Bye.